Okay, maternal nursing, newborn. Today we are talking about the labor process, chapter eight. And so we've been talking and building up and having this baby, we've gone from conception and now we actually get to meet the baby face to face. So today we'll talk about laboring the baby. There are four essential components of labor and we call those the four P's of labor. It's passageway, passengers, powers, and psyche. Any problem in any of these areas will influence the labor negative, negatively. So passageway, that is talking about the bony pelvis and the soft tissues of the cervix and the vagina. The passenger, of course, is talking about the fetus, the baby. The powers are the maternal pushing effort. Those are like the contractions, involuntary muscle contractions of the uterus. And then the psyche has many factors which can affect it but it's the psychological state of the laboring woman. Okay, so pelvic shape, gynecoid. This is gonna be the most favorable for a vagina birth, and this is that shape. It's a rounded shape, and so it makes it the easiest for the baby's head to come through. Anthropoid is going to be um, elongated shape. That is more like a man's pelvis. Anthroid is the heart shape. Plap of platypoploid is going to be flat in dimension, so it's almost squished. So whenever we're looking at the pelvic, we're looking at the dimensions, and it's most important to the OB doctor, the obstetric conjugate. So that is going to be the smallest part of the pelvis, where the head will have to go through. It has to pass through that smallest part. If it cannot pass through that smallest part, then there's no purpose in, of the woman even trying to labor. It's not going to happen. And if that happens, we call that cephalopelvic disorder, or CPD. And in the charts, you might see something C-section due to CPD. So that's what that's talking about. The head, the baby's head, cephal cephala, would not pass through the pelvic of the woman. All right, the birth canal, we're talking about the soft tissue of the cervix and the vagina that is forming the birth canal. That is also what's gonna be aphasing. And when you talk about aphasement, you think of the cervix thinning down, getting shorter, and it's recorded in a percentage. So if it's 100% aphase, that means that it is completely shrunk down and we're starting to dilate. You can have aphasement happening as dilation is taking place. Dilation is the circle part of it. You have to be fully dilated to a 10 before you ever um, start pushing, okay? So that's just a cervical dilation. Whenever it's a one, it like barely, your pinky will barely fit into it. And then you just go down three, four, five, all the way to 10. And that's dilation. Okay, so when we're talking about the fetus, we're looking at the fetus's skull. And the fetus, fetal skull is very important in relation to labor and birth. Molding is overlapping of these suture bones. And as you can see, these sutures, the baby's uh, brain, the bones, are not fully fused together. You'll see the lines, those are the suture lines. There's one in the back called the posterior, there's one in the front called the anterior. It's more of a diamond shape, and then the back one is more of a triangular shape. So these are not fused fully together, and the purpose of that is when the baby is passing through the pelvis, they're able to overlap a little bit. Now, when we're talking about fetal accommodation to the passageway, we're also talking about the line, the lie of the baby. Longitudinal lie is going to be the long axis of the fetus is parallel to the long axis of the mother. So that would be a longitudinal lie. The spines match up of the fetus and the mother. Transverse lie is going to be the long axis of the fetus is perpendicular to the long axis of the woman. It's kind of right in the middle. Um, well, it's like this. And then oblique lie will be in the middle of the two of them. Okay, transverse, longitudinal, oblique, kind of in between. Transverse lie. There we go. Okay, presentation. The foremost part of the fetus that enters the pelvic inlet. So again, we're looking at our pelvis, we're looking at the fetus, and it depends on what area the baby enters into. And with this, you need to look at 171 in your book, and you're going to see this a lot better. Um, 
the very bottom of it. Okay, so three main ways a fetus can present. You have the head, cephalic presentation, which is going to be the most favorable. Then you have the feet, or the buttocks, which is going to be breech, breech presentation, or you have the shoulder. And, and remember, we talked about if the shoulder presents, there is a likelihood that you will have shoulder dystocia and it will break that baby's clavicle. Okay, attitude, passenger. This is the relationship of the fetus's part to one, an one another. You have vertex, which is the attitude of flexion. It's most favorable for a vaginal deliver delivery. So they are head down, they're tucked, their chin is down, they are ready to come through. Milit military is, think about that head straight up. And then brow, you're actually going to see the baby's brow. And then face is going to be full extension. You see that baby's face. So remember, vertex is most favorable for a vaginal delivery. Position. This is the relationship of the reference point of the presenting part to the quadrants of the maternal pelvis. So when you're looking for this one, you need to go ahead and turn in your book to page 173, and you are going to see how the baby's presentation part will go left or right, depending on the mother, and then it's talking about the occipitant, which is the back of the baby's head, or um, the occipitant, which it will refer to anterior or posterior, depending on the mother, which side of the mother's pelvis we're looking at. Okay, so with this, you have first designation refers to the side of the pelvis in which the reference point is found. The second de designation is going to be a reference point on the presenting part. And then third will be where it refers to the part of the pelvis, front, back, or side, in which side the reference point is found. Okay, so when looking in the book on page 173, the most favorable, the one that we love to see as nurses, as doctors, and the one that you as a mother want to hear is that your baby is head down and it's left occipitate interior. And that means that the baby's head is down, but um, the back of the skull is going to be facing the front of the mother, just like this. And you can have left or right, but you want occipitate, which is the back of the skull, to anterior, okay? So the baby comes out nice and smooth. Now, if the baby is sunny side up or face up, you are going to hear the mother complain of horrible, horrendous back pain. And that is going to be called left occipitate posterior. That is not as favorable. The most favorable is going to be the left occipitate anterior or the right occipitate anterior. And then you can also see where left occipitate transverse happens. And you can see the pictures of the skulls where the baby's head is just not making it through. So sometimes it either has to turn, we'll have to go in there, we'll have to assist the baby to turn, um, or if the baby cannot come through, then you would have to do an emergency C-section. Okay, fetal station. This is real. This is the relationship of the presenting part, the head, to the ischial spine, which is those little things right there. So we're looking at the pelvis, and when we're referring to this, we're talking about stations. Now up high is going to be a negative station because they have not engaged into these little spines yet. Whenever the head engages into the spine, you are now at a zero station, so it goes negative zero and then plus zero, plus stations. That means the presenting part is below the ischial spines. Okay, so one way to think of this is plus four hit the floor. So the baby is coming out. It's going to hit the floor, floor at plus four. Now, if the baby's head is not engaged and that mother's membranes have already been ruptured, we will not let her walk around. And think about this for a second. The baby's head is up high. It has not engaged in those spines. What does that put her at risk for? And here, we're looking at this baby, and we have the umbilical cord. Head's not engaged yet. If it gets engaged, she's walking around, it has a tendency to make the, pro the cord prolapse. And if that baby's head 
is compressing that cord during contractions or whatever, that baby is not going to be getting oxygen. So if the mother's membranes are not ruptured and her, the head is not in those spines yet, she's at a negative station, we will not be letting her walk around. Okay, for fear of prolapse cord. Okay, now we're at powers, and these are the phases of involuntary uterine contractions. Okay, these, this is when she is having contractions now. And how we measure contractions, we talk about them in increment, acne, de decrement, and then the relaxation phase. And you can see a picture of this on 174, so you can walk through it. The increment is the building up of the contraction, and this is going to be the longest phase. It's the getting there, the going up, the uphill rise, okay? And so that's the longest phase. At the very top, the peak of the contraction, that is the acne, and then the decrement is the letting up phase. Of course, she's more relaxed in this phase, and then it moves into relaxation period, and that is the rest between the contractions. Okay, so next when we're talking about um, contractions, we're going to measure them in frequency, duration, and intensity. So the frequency is going to be how often the contractions are occurring. And when a woman comes in, we're asking her, well, how often are you having contractions? How long do they last? And even the intensity, of course, for a laboring woman, everything is going to be, oh, they're strong, they're killing me. But frequency is going to be how often the contractions are occurring. And this is measured from counting the time interval from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the following. Frequent, how often are they coming? Every three to five minutes? Every four minutes? Okay, how long are they lasting? This is their duration. The interval from the beginning of a contraction to the end. How long does it last? Uh, it's about 30 seconds every five to nine minutes. Okay, and then intensity, we're going to measure intensity by mild, moderate, or strong. And we don't necessarily ask the woman about the intensity as much. Sometimes we will, we'll say, how strong are they? Well, they're pretty strong. But we also have a contraption when we hook her up to the electric fetal monitoring system that will show us how intense those contractions are. And the way we measure it is mild, moderate, or strong. And whenever you um, push on your nose, your chin, you'll see this is mild, it's kind of squishy, moderate, a little bit more firm, and then strong. Hopefully your forehead is not too squishy and it's actually, you can feel that bone, it feels strong. Um, like I said, we have a toco monitor, it has a spring-loaded button and that will also show us the intensity on her contractions. Okay. Psyche, there are so many factors that influence the psyche of a laboring patient. It's current pregnancy experience. Is this a good pregnancy experience? Has she had a good pregnancy experience throughout the whole pregnancy, the nine months? Um, or is it one that was unplanned and it's been stressful? Previous birth experiences, were they, was it a good experience or did she have a lot of complications? And then expectations for current birth experience. Is she one of those ladies who has the 20 page birth plan and it's not going accordingly or is she one who is happy because all she needed was the epidural, she's got it, she's good to go now. And then preparation for birth. Is she ready for birth or um, is she a little bit more stressed out, fearful of birth, fearful of the pain? Whenever we're looking at psyche, we have to remember that fear and anxiety can interfere with the labor process, and it can actually slow the labor process down. Okay, so the process of labor, the onset of labor. There are many theories of what causes labor to um, occur. However, none of them are conclusive, and if you have ever been pregnant and you've been at that 40-week mark, I'm sure you have heard every wise tell that there is from castor oil to walking to sex to whatever. The truth is that no one really knows for sure what causes pregnancy to start. To start. However, there's many, many theories on it. Um, progesterone withdrawal theory. It's saying that the progesterone has suddenly dropped off and because of that it causes the body to go into um, contractions and getting ready to have 
in pregnancy, expelling that baby. Oxytocin theory, um, you've heard of nipple stimulation. Well, sometimes that nipple stimulation will release the oxytocin and cause labor. Prostaglandin theory, um, again, may influence it, but it's not conclusive. The DVD that we watched on chapter five showed that fetal lungs um, initiated. So like I said, there's many, many, many theories out there. However, we really just don't know what causes it to start. However, what we do know is that many factors do start the labor. Many factors cause this cascade effect. Um, along with that, you're gonna see anticipatory anticipatory signs of labor and this is like the lightning or a sense that the baby has dropped you'll see a 39 week old mother 39 week gestational mother walking around and it looks like all of a sudden the baby is lower than it was and you might hear women say oh yeah your baby is dropped you're gonna have that baby anytime now Braxton Hicks contractions they're fall, false labor pains but they'll start coming up and it, they'll start kind of preparing you for pregnancy. And the reason we know that Braxton Hicks are not real contractions, there's several ways. One, if the um, intensity decreases while walking or with movement, then you know that it is Braxton Hicks. M position changes, anything like that, cause them to go away, Braxton Hicks. And then, the main reason that you're going to know a real true um, contraction from a false contraction is cervical dilation, which is something obviously that the doctor will have to tell you. You're not going to be doing vaginal checks on yourself, but that is how you know it's true contractions, true labor. Uh, you'll see GI disturbances. You might start feeling very nauseous, having diarrhea. It's like your um, system is just clearing out, getting ready for this baby heartburn, mining crease, expelling of the mucus plug. It's kind of a clear pink tinge discharge that you will see. Sometimes women lose it in the bathtub or while they're going to the bathroom. And um, again, it's just a clear pink tinged uh, mucus plug. Sometimes they notice it, other times they don't. Uh, my favorite was always that feeling of a burst of energy called the nesting phase. You're all of a sudden cleaning out closets and dusting baseboards because yes, your baby's really gonna care about the dust on the baseboards, but you have this feeling of burst of energy. Now, the challenge here is that there's a reason you have that feeling of a burst of energy, and it's not so you can clean out closets and you know organize your spice rack or anything like that. It's so that you are you have enough energy for labor. So it's kind of a hard thing, but sometimes we have to help those mothers not go overboard and clean their house and kind of reserve some of that energy for labor. And then the last one that we're gonna talk about is like the ripening, the softening, and phasement, the thinning of the cervix. And again, that's something that your doctor will tell you about. Um, when he goes in, he or when you start going into your weekly visits up on those last stages, week 37, 38, 39, 40, they'll be doing vaginal checks. So they'll see if you're dilated and they'll also see um, how aphased you are. Uh, the process of labor. The differences between true labor and false labor or prodromal labor. For dromal labor, labor, you'll have increased in Braxton Hicks contractions without cervical changes. So that's the big one. If you don't have cervical changes, they are only Braxton Hicks, no matter how uncomfortable they are. Uh, true labor, you're going to see progressive dilation and aphasement of the cervix. Okay, so the, mechanic, the mechanics of spontaneous vaginal delivery. You're going to see cardinal movements. Um, mechanisms of delivery. You're going to see engagement where the baby's head actually engages in those spines. You're going to see descent moving downward. You're going to see the flexion where the baby is starting to um, kind of duck its head down and then go past that point. Internal rotation, extension where that baby's head comes up, external rotation, and expulsion where the baby actually comes out. Uh, cardinal movements of vaginal birth, go ahead and watch that. That's a YouTube and it kind of goes through it better than I can. 
Okay, stages and duration of labor. The first stage is going to be dilation, and I want you to notice with the first stage that you will also see three phases in that first stage. So the first stage, you have got to go from zero to complete dilation, the 10. All right, so early labor is latent phase, and that is from zero to four centimeters. You will not get a hospital bed unless you have complications, but as far as just going, looking at dilation, you will not get a hospital bed until you're at least a four. And so that means that you are a four and you are about to enter into active labor, the second phase. Active labor is going to be from four to eight centimeters dilation. And then transition phase is eight centimeters to a full dilation. Now sometimes in this transition period, women are going to want to push. They are going to want to get that baby out. However, they are not fully dilated. And unless you are a full 10, a full dilation, we do not want them to push. We discourage them from pushing too early. It can put them at risk for complications, bruising, lacerations, causing the baby um, harm as well. So we will not let them push. It can also, because of, because of pushing before it's fully dilated, it can cause swelling and that will only slow the process down further. So until she gets to the second stage, she cannot push, actively push. At the second stage, however, she is a 10 and she is ready to push. She is ready to give birth to that baby. And so this is where we encourage her to push and go ahead and expel that baby out. At the third stage, this is after the baby's been born and now we are having the delivery of the placenta. And when that placenta is coming off of that wall, separating from that wall, a lot of times you'll see a gush of blood, a lengthening of the umbilical cord, and then a largening of the fundus. And that is that placenta is coming off of that wall and she passes that placenta. So even though she has um, got the baby out, there's still probably going to be one hard push and one good contraction to go ahead and deliver that placenta. Now the fourth stage of labor is the recovery phase. And this is where we really go into action. We are checking our vital, vital signs, we are massaging that fundus, trying to make those vessels clamp down so that it's not boggy, but it gets back to a firm state, and that she isn't bleeding out. We are wa watching and monitoring for bleeding. Okay, when you're looking at the placenta, you're gonna see two different sides of it. And what you'll see is Dirty Duncan, which is gonna be the side that was connected to the mom, the maternal side, and then you're gonna see Shiny Schult, which is the side that was connected to the fetus. And so the doctor will look at that and he'll look the uh, placenta over and make sure that it is whole, it's complete, that there aren't any fragments still left inside the mother. If she does have fragments left inside of her, that does put her at risk for bleeding and hemorrhaging. So we're gonna definitely look at the placenta. Another fun fact is some cultures like to eat the placenta or mix it up into a shake and drink it. Anyways, culturally accepting of all things. Maternal physiological adaption. Okay, so increased demand for oxygen during that first stage of labor. If for some reason the mother's oxygen stat starts going low, we'll go ahead and put some oxygen on her. We might encourage her to breathe through a mask, especially monitoring that baby, looking at that fetal heart rate and uh, fetal monitoring and making sure that the baby isn't in any kind of distress through those contractions. Remember, when the contraction happens, that placenta is not getting blood or oxygen nutrients to that baby. So we wanna also be monitoring the fetus the entire time. Um, you might also see her, an increase in her heart rate. When you're looking at her blood pressure, it should be pretty stable, pretty normal. Um, for a preeclampsia patient, we are watching her blood pressure very closely. Increased cardiac output, of course, demands on the heart. Increased respiratory rate, GI, gastrointestinal, and then urinary um, symptoms. A full bladder can impede labor and slow it down, so we want to make sure that she does not have a full bladder. 
and that means if she hasn't had an epidural, we'll probably get her up, we'll take her to the bathroom. If she has or does have already an epidural, we might just do a straight cath, we might put a Foley catheter in there, but we want to make sure that that bladder is not full. Okay, so maternal psychological adaptation. In the early stage of labor, she is excited and talkative. She's going to tell you all about her day and how she started having contractions and it just scared her. She'll probably tell you how she lost her mucus plug. She will tell you whatever you want to know. During the active labor, however, she starts becoming more introverted, more quiet, focusing all of her energies on coping with the stress of the contractions. And then transition, she might feel a little out of control. These contractions are getting too hard, and what am I thinking, and what did he do to me? And then pushing, she's going to feel a little bit more control because she knows that baby is almost here. It's close. We just got to hang in there. We're almost there. Women, however, who are unprepared for pregnancy psychologically, they will oftentimes... Um, just lose control during that active phase and they may resort to screaming, crying, punching, hitting, thrashing during all those contractions. This is not good. It will slow down labor. So that is why as nurses we want to encourage these women to go to classes, um, uh, prep classes, laboring classes and kind of prepare them for the process. Those women who are more in control seem to fare better and do better and handle labor better in general. Okay, so fetal adaption to labor. We're going to see an increase in intracranial pressure. We're going to see that placental blood flow temporarily interrupted during the contraction. So think about it. During a contraction, your stomach, your muscles, they're all getting tight. That um, blood flow is not crossing over to the baby. However, a healthy fetus, this should not be a problem. They have enough compensation mechanisms that they'll be able to recover from it. However, that is why we have them hooked up to electronic fetal monitoring and we're watching to make sure that there are no D cells, which mean hypoxic, hypoxic events, um, that they're not getting enough oxygen. They should be able to recover from it and do just fine. Uh, while passing through the birth canal, it's beneficial to the fetus in two ways. One, it stimulates surfactant production. So when that baby is coming through, you think of that tight space, and every woman who's ever had labor thinks a 10 centimeter, you know, uh, a size of a lemon or a grapefruit out, a watermelon out the size of a lemon, you know what I'm trying to say, a very small space. Well, because that baby goes through such a small space, it squeezes their lungs and that stimulates surfactant production. And surfactant is what opens those alveolas up and allows um, air to just burst into them. So this helps clear the respiratory passageways. It gets all that fluid out of the baby's lungs, stimulates that surfactant to start working. And so that's why we always want to encourage, if at all possible, a vaginal birth over a cesarean birth. It just gives that baby one more head start um, versus a cesarean baby. All right, and then fetal adaptions to labor. Um, we're also going to talk about ecchymosis, which is bruising. It can happen if the baby's been in the birth canal too long, as well as edema. Capita secadenum means that it is edema over the caput, the baby's head. And the difference in this in cephalotoma and hematoma is that a hematoma will not cross these suture lines. Edema will cross over, but a hematoma will stay on the suture line, so it will not cross over. And that's how you can know which is which. When you're filling the baby and you see it, it's that cone head looking, um, it, it looks like a cone head. Know that it will go away, but it will be a little squishy. Put a hat on them, no one will even notice, and let the parents know that it will eventually go away within time. Alright, that takes care of it for today. Thanks.